Welcome to Through the Bible. Today we pick up our study in Revelation chapter 6 at verse 7, where our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us about a rider on a pale horse named Death. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and I'm so glad that you've joined us for this fascinating study that gives us more detail about the wrath of the Lamb, also known as the Day of the Lord. Before we get started, though, I'll share a couple of great letters that we've recently received from Bible bus passengers just like you. The first is from Larry in Rapid City, South Dakota. About 40 years ago, listening to Dr. McGee, I gave my life to Christ. I was working on a ranch at the time and was in a 7520 John Deere tractor all by myself. Just me, the tractor, and the radio. I'll never forget that day as long as I live when I prayed the sinner's prayer. It was like somebody lifted a big sack of potatoes off my back. I used to drink quite a lot and I lost the desire instantly. The grass got greener, the sky got bluer, and everything just perked up. And I also had the craving to read God's Word. I couldn't get enough of it. It truly was a miracle, to me anyway. I now have two grown boys and three grandchildren, and they're all serving Jesus. Praise God. This ministry and Dr. McGee have truly been a blessing to me and my family. Thank you. Isn't that wonderful? Here's a similar letter. This is from a listener of our Amharic language broadcast over in Ethiopia. I want to tell you that the TTB radio program has brought a change in my life. It inspired and encouraged me to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus is my Redeemer. His loving mercies have lifted me up from the unrighteous life where I was bound to a sinful living situation. Praise to Jesus Christ. If I hadn't heard your program on the radio, I know I would not have had the opportunity to become a child of God. Thank you. Well, praise God for His Word that can pierce our hearts no matter where we live, Ethiopia or in the middle of our country. If our time together studying the Bible has changed your life, or if you have a story to share about what you're learning through His Word, we'd love to hear from you. You know, contacting us is very easy. Simply call and leave a message on our listener testimony line at 1-800-65-BIBLE, or you can send us an email at biblebus at ttb.org, or just mail your letter to Box 7100. Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today through your word. Through these strange and wonderful passages, Lord, help us to see the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time I read the seventh and eighth verses that tell us about the fourth seal that the Lord Jesus broke in the book, and then there went forth the rider on a pale horse. We didn't quite get through that, and I'm going to pick up our study where we left off, but I'd like to read these two verses again in my translation, which I don't recommend. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Go! And I looked, and behold, a pale, that is, a greenish-yellow horse, and the one sitting upon him. Death was his name, and Hades followed with him. And there was given unto them authority over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with death, our pestilence, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Now, when these horsemen ride, apparently a fourth of the population of the earth is removed by these judgments that come upon the earth. Now, death here is personalized. You'll notice death was his name, and that is the same thing that we have from Paul in Romans 5, 14, where he says, And nevertheless, death became king from Adam down to Moses, and over them who did not sin after the fashion of Adam's sin or transgression, who is the type of him 
that is of Adam, who was to come, that is the coming one. Now, death was his name. And then uh, we're told that Hades followed with him. Now, the word for Hades is sometimes translated by the word hell, unfortunately. Over in Luke, the 16th chapter, verse 23, it says, speaking of the rich man and Lazarus, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. That's very unfortunate. It is this same word, Hades. And actually, it does not refer to hell at all. It speaks either of physical death, where the spirit goes, or it can speak of the grave, where the body is placed. In other words, while death takes the body, Hades is the place where the spirit of a lost man goes, and the Lord Jesus gave it that way, you see. Now, Paul personifies death in this verse I've given from Romans 5.14, and as he does sin in that same section, and he does it for emphasis. You see, sin and death entered the world at the same time. Death is a result of sin. And during the interval from Adam to Moses, men did not commit the same sin as did Adam. Adam was put on a different basis. Nor was their sinning a transgression of a law as from Adam. Also, the Ten Commandments had not been given then. So you have a period there when men sinned and died. Nevertheless, Adam's sin became their sin for they died as Adam died. Even babies died in the flood. Now, death has evidently an all-inclusive meaning that we do not attach to it ordinarily. We think of death referring only to the body, or what we call physical death, and it refers only to the body. And it comes to a man because of Adam's sin. Then there's what is known as spiritual death. That is separation from and rebellion against God. We inherit a dead nature from Adam. That is, we have no capacity for God, no desire for him at all. And then there is eternal death, and that's eternal separation from God. And unless a man is redeemed, this inevitably follows. And this is the second death that we will find later on in Revelation 20, 14. And I'm going to bring these three up again and develop them when we get to Revelation 20, 14. But you see, when Adam sinned, God said, in the day you eat, you'll die. Well, he lived 900 and some odd years after that physically, but he was dead spiritually to God. He ran from God, no longer desire for fellowship with God. He died spiritually, and physical death followed and has come into the human family, and more and more it deteriorates mankind. Most of us are being propped up today anyway. That's the way we stay alive because of modern medicine and the marvelous developments of science actually the human race is deteriorating all the time. Human life would be much shorter than it is if it were not for all of the modern gadgets to prop us up and keep us alive down here. Now, Adam is definitely declared here to be a type of Christ. Death must be laid at Adam's door as his total responsibility. You see, God did not create man to die. It was a penalty imposed because Adam transgressed God's command. His transgression is our transgression, and his death is our death. Thus, Christ is the head of a new creation, and this new creation has life in him, and only in Christ. He alone can give life, and he is totally responsible for the life and the bliss of those that are his own. Dr. Schaefer put it like this, and this is a theological statement. Thus, spiritual death comes immediately through an unbroken line of posterity. Over against this, physical death is received from Adam 
immediately as each person dies in body because of his own personal share in Adam's first sin. Now, during the great tribulation, death will ride unbridled. The Lord Jesus put it like this, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now, at the great white throne, death is finally destroyed. And we are going to see that later on. Paul confirmed this. He said, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And John reasserts it in Revelation 21, 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. This is something that's very important for us to see. Now we see that the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts will decimate this earth by one-fourth. And this is something that God had said would come. Ezekiel had predicted it in Ezekiel 14, 21. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. So the pale horse represents plague and pestilence that will stalk the earth and it will also encompass the possibility of germ warfare. And I don't want to get into that today, but there are men that have made the statement, and there's scientists. One of them, Dr. Holtman at the University of Tennessee, says, while the greater part of a city's population could be destroyed by an atomic bomb, the bacteria method might easily wipe out the entire population within a week. Now that brings us down to the fifth seal, and I want to read again my translation in verses 9 and 10. Now the four horsemen have ridden, and here we have the prayer of the martyred remnant. Uh, apparently those that were slain in the great tribulation seem to be primarily the ones that are here. I have always felt that it included all the Old Testament saints, but let me read now my translation here. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of burnt sacrifice the souls of those slain on account of the word of God and on account of the witness which they had. And they cried with a great voice, saying, How long, O Master, the holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now this altar is in heaven and is evidently where Christ offered his blood for the sins of the world. And those of you acquainted with my book on the tabernacle know that I take that position that his literal blood is in heaven. Now let me confirm that with Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but in heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so we have here the Old Testament saints, as the Lord Jesus put it, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias. And now included with this are those in the great tribulation period because we've already found a fourth of the population have been wiped out and they are resting on Old Testament ground and they're on good solid ground. They are only pleading for justice on the basis of God's holy law. Now notice verse 11 and again I'm reading my translation. That was given to them, that is to each one a white robe and it was said to them that they should rest in peace yet for a little time until their fellow servants also and their brethren who should be killed even as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, the tribulation saints, all of them are to be included in the second resurrection, by the way. Now, that brings us to the opening of the sixth seal, and now the great day of God's wrath has come. 
This is evidently the beginning of the last half of the Great Tribulation period. We're going to make a division in it a little later on. But let me read again my translation, verses 12 and 13. And I saw when he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the whole moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree casteth her up unripe figs when she is shaken of a great wind. Now, the great day of his wrath is before us, and it opens with these tremendous events in the heavens. In other words, at the beginning of the tribulation, you have all of these events taking place, and you also have it at the end of the great tribulation period. And you find that in Joel, the second chapter, verse 30, at the beginning of the tribulation, at the end, Joel 3, 9, 17. We've seen that before. Now, the fact we're having an increase of earthquakes today is no fulfillment of this at all. This is to take place in the great tribulation period. But the interesting thing is that earthquakes in the past have really taken off a great deal of the population of this earth. Professor R.A. Daly, in his book, Our Mobile Earth, has written this. In the last 4,000 years, earthquakes have caused the loss of 13 million lives, and the most awful earth shock is yet to come. And that's interesting because we're going to find out a little later on in Revelation 16, 18, that there's a great earthquake such as there was not since there were men upon the earth, so great an earthquake, so mighty, and the cities of the nations fell. What a picture that you have here. Now, the earthquakes today are not a fulfillment of this. They just merely show that it could happen as God's Word says it will. Now, verse 14 in my translation, And the heaven was removed as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, this verse, I think, is to be taken quite literally. We've had the same thing in Nahum 1, 5. We're going to see it again in Revelation 20, verse 11, and I'll save it till then. Now, I want to read verses 15 and 17 again in my translation. And the kings of the earth, and the princes, and the chief captains, and the rich, and the strong, and every bondman and free man hid themselves in the caves and rocks of the mountains. And they say to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of the one sitting on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath came, and who is able to stand? Now, we have here something that's quite interesting. There are those on the earth that are praying to the rocks and to the mountains to fall on them, because they want to be hidden from whom? The wrath of the Lamb. Now, this is the great day of the wrath of God. But now we come to an interesting statement, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the wrath of God is that day, the day of the Lord, that day that we've seen all the way through the Old Testament. That is the Old Testament prophets. It's a day that is coming upon the earth. It's yet future. And we're told it's the wrath of the Lamb. Now, there is a strange statement. The Bible is filled with paradoxes, and I'm sure that you've discovered that Scripture abounds with them. Now, somebody says, well, what's a paradox? Well, haven't you heard the definition of a paradox? It's two doctors in conference. Well, that'd be a paradox, but this is different. It's a proposition which is contrary to received opinion. That is, that which is seemingly contradictory. On the surface, the assertion seems contradictory but closer examination reveals it's factual. In other words, here's several of these paradoxes. The farther an object goes from you, the larger it gets. Now, you know that's not true, is it? But it is true. When a balloon goes up, it'll get smaller to the eye, but the balloon is getting larger all the time as the atmosphere gets thinner. Then here's another paradox. Water flows uphill in Sequoia National Park. 
Nobody said, I don't believe it. Well, my friend, literally tons of it flows uphill. And you say, well, that certainly is a paradox. It certainly is. But Sequoia National Park is filled with giant redwoods. And those giant redwoods are pulling up tons of water all the time. They call it osmosis. That's a scientific word that means they don't know what really it's all about. But that's what's happening. And then the closer you get to the sun, the hotter it is. Well, out in the Hawaiian Islands, in a tropical climate, which you look up on the top of Mauna Kea, and there's snow up there, and it's closer to the sun than you are. May I say to you, there are a lot of paradoxes that are true. Now, the Christian life is a series of paradoxes. For when I was weak, then I'm strong. Well, we've got one here, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, the Lamb is a familiar figure of Christ. And how in a world can a little lamb that's noted for gentleness and meekness suppose it did get angry? What then? <laughs> it's like a tempest in a teapot. Well, will you notice from the days of Abel to John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ is depicted as a lamb. John says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God did not choose the lamb because it possessed characteristics of Christ, neither sacrificial aspects. God created such an animal to represent Christ. And that little lamb was the animal. And that's the reason God created it, because Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before any lamb was ever created. Now, he has the qualities of a lamb. He was meek. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He says, I'm meek and lowly. He was gentle. <laughs> Suffer the little children to come unto me. He was harmless. You never saw a sign up, beware of the lamb. You've seen a sign, beware of a dog, but not a lamb. He was harmless. He was humble. Christ washed the feet of his disciples. Now, this is a tremendous thing. Here we have one whose life was marked by winsomeness. His life was like the perfume of a lovely and fragile flower. His coming was a doxology. His stay was a blessing, and his departure was a benediction. Even the unbelieving world has been fascinated by his life. Now, the lamb sets forth his sacrifice. Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb, and God did provide himself a lamb. Then, what about the wrath? Well, that's strange and foreign even to the person of God, is it not? God, though, loves the good. God hates the evil. He does not hate as you and I hate. He's not vindictive. God is righteous. God is holy. And he hates that which is contrary to him. He calls himself Jehovah is a man of war. He's strong and mighty. He's mighty in battle. And the gospel reveals the wrath of God. Paul said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And you look at this world we're in today, my friend. It reveals already the wrath of God, the judgment of God. Now, it's like mixing fire and water to bring wrath and a lamb together. But all the fury of the wrath of God's revealed in the lamb. May I say to you, when he was here, he made a scourge of small cords. He drove out the money changers. Was he bluffing? He was not. He called the religious rulers a generation of vipers. Why did sepulchers? He cursed the fig tree, said, Woe unto you, Capernaum. And Christ rejected Jerusalem, but he had tears in his eyes. He still controls the forces of nature, and he uses them in judgment. God has declared war against sin, and I say, blessed be his name, and he'll not compromise with that which has brought such havoc to the human family. There is a day coming when the wrath of the Lamb will be revealed. Somebody said, I thought he was gentle and not punished sin. He says, be wise. Now, therefore, ye kings, ye judges of the earth, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the earth. If you haven't yet chosen to believe in Jesus Christ, these can be troublesome passages. But there's good news for those who put their faith and hope in Him. 
As Jesus himself reassures us in John 3.18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So if you'd like to know more about this important decision and how you can have a personal relationship with the God of the universe through his Son, please visit our website at ttb.org and click on the page that says, How Can I Know God? Or call us today at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And if you'd like to know more about the wrath of the Lamb that was discussed today and other great doctrines about the person and work of Christ, then check out Dr. McGee's book titled, Jesus, Centerpiece of Scripture. Our journey through the book of Revelation continues tomorrow as the Bible bus presses on in Revelation 7. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here saving a seat just for you. This program's been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.